Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, we will get started. It looks like we have a nice crowd here tonight. So this is, it's really great to see everyone here. Um, I wanna welcome you to the Library Company of Philadelphia's 2024 Women's History Month Fireside Chat. We are really happy to share some time with you this evening. My name is Amy Sopchek joseph and I'm the director of the Davida Tenenbaum Deutsch Program in Women's History at the Library Company. And I'm also an assistant professor of history at Wilkes University. In my brief introduction tonight, I just wanna say a few things about the library company itself, women and the institution and that history, and then I will introduce our speaker and turn it over. The library company of Philadelphia was founded in 1731 by Benjamin Franklin, um, and it started as a subscription library supported by shareholders, which it is until its day, uh, until this day. The library company is an independent research library concentrating on American society and culture from the 17th through the 19th centuries. It is free and open to the public and the library company, as many of you probably already know, houses an extensive non-circulating collection of rare books, as well as manuscripts, broadsides, ephemera, prints, uh, photographs, and works of art. Our mission is to foster scholarship in and increase public understanding of American history before 1900 by both preserving those materials and interpreting really valuable materials um, in our care to the public. So the library company connects with thousands of visitors annually, both in person and virtually like tonight. Um, and we're trying to ensure that the lessons of the past will continue to amaze, instruct, and inspire future generations. Um, and so we're trying to serve a diverse constituency, not only in Philadelphia, um, but through the magic of technology, hopefully across the nation as well. And we're really excited to have you here this evening. Our program tonight um, specifically is generously sponsored by the Davida Tenenbaum Deutsch Program in Women's History, which funds things like fellowships for researchers, acquisitions of materials related to women's history, as well as programming. And it has done that for the past decade. And the, women's, the history of women's involvement at the library company, though, is far lengthier than the past decade. It's lengthy and nuanced. Women have been using the collections at the library company and buying shares um, for many generations. The beloved books and papers of many women can be called from the stacks. And women are foundational and can, have been in the past and continue to be foundational to the everyday work of the institution. Um, I was very lucky to meet and work with a number of very thoughtful and generous women when I was at the library company on fellowship a few years ago. And many of these scholars who have been interacting with our collections come back to the library company in some capacity through programs and interacting with other researchers, which is really great. We love to foster that community. Um, so I'm really excited to introduce to our community tonight our speaker, Dr. Andrea Pappas, uh, who is an associate professor of art and art history at Santa Clara University. So she, while my uh, background is gonna be getting um, darker and darker, her background is going to stay amazingly light. Um, she has published on topics ranging from the Renaissance to the present and is interested in questions about both the production, artist-centered and reception, audience-centered aspects of art, visual and material culture. Her most recent publications include an essay on the early work of Mark Rothko for a forthcoming book about the Rothko Chapel and her new book, which I also, you're gonna see it in a minute, but it exists in real life too. Um, this, com this copy will go to library company quite soon. So if you want to go and, and call for it there, you can do so as well. Um, Dr. Pappas is going to be 
talking for about 40 to 45 minutes, sharing a number of images with us from this really image rich book. And then we will shift to a question and answer period. And I know we are all, we're all Zoom natives now perhaps, um, but I want to encourage you to use the question and answer function here on Zoom um, to put your, your questions in as you think of them throughout the program. And then at the end, um, I will come in and dole out questions to Dr. Pappas as well. Um, so please, uh, from your homes, let's welcome Dr. Pappas to our screens. Thank you so much. Let me share my screen here. Um, there you go. Hopefully you can see my um, slides there. Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you to the library company uh, for inviting me here today and to Emily Guthrie, who until recently was with the library company and is now at Williamsburg. Um, because she assisted with the birth of this project. Um, and I would like to thank everybody um, who is attending. Thank you for your time and attention. I'm going to be talking about large embroidered pictures, which are different from samplers. Um, and I'll explain that in just a sec. We're going to look at who made them, and because they differ greatly from paintings in their uh, visual logic, I will talk a little bit about how to look at them. Then I'm going to talk about a couple of the motifs and images that display women's engagement with nature and what they knew about it. And um, my book engages us in more detail and for more images, so we're just going to kind of be hitting a couple of the important things. So let's just take a look. Um, and first thing I want to do is just show you the back um, of these of one of these. So you see the front over there on your left and on the right, you see the back of it. Um, we were fortunate to be able to get a photograph of this when it was conserved recently. But um, what I want to call your attention to is how bright the original color is. Um, I mean, these things are beautiful, but when we really start thinking about the original color, we can see that they're um, they were just vibrant. So as we go through the slides today, please um, try to picture them in all of their former jewel tone glory. <laughs> um, oops. Um, so samplers. Samplers um, are uh, part of a woman's education in sewing. They, uh, women started learning to sew around age five um, and uh, with just simple sewing. Um, every woman had to learn to sew to make garments, household linens, and so forth. But uh, women who were daughters of wealthy families um, would have a more advanced aesthetic education, and this frequently included embroidery. So what you're looking at on the left is a band sampler made by Laura Standish. Yes, that Standish, Miles Standish's daughter. Um, and you can see the rows of letters and sample patterns, and then it has a little verse at the bottom. On the right, you're looking at a more typical sampler, what we tend to think of as a more typical sampler with the alphabet um, and some maybe some numbers across the top, and then a little verse and then a little decorative border, in this case with her name, Catherine Bradstreet. Um, Sometimes these samplers, a more advanced type of sampler would be a little bit bigger and it would include an image along with some text. And you're looking at a really typical uh, piece there on the left that comes out of a particular Rhode Island school. Um, but women uh, with these advanced embroidery skills also made a lot of other things, including um, embroidered upholstery. And so I'm just showing you a detail here from a chair. Um, that was made in, in and around Boston um, in the second quarter of the uh, 17th or the 18th century. Um, I have to say that's very brave. I wouldn't let anybody sit on it if I put that much work into it. Um, but uh, the point being is that these pictures are part of a larger um, system of embroidered uh, decorative textiles in the um, elite family home. Okay, how to look at these things. As you, this is probably the most famous one because it depicts a known location, and um, but these, um, but as you can see, it does not look like a Renaissance style painting with the vanishing point and and a very consistent scale throughout the image, um, and there are several reasons for this. Um, it's so. What I want to say is that once you understand the visual logic of these things, then it's much easier to decipher what's depicted. Uh, because they have a kind of unique visual logic, it has been very easy for them to be dismissed as um, 
you know, naive or, you know, simply, you know, schoolgirl projects. Um, but as we dig into it, we can see that there's more going on. So the first thing I want to call your attention to is that we do hear from Hannah Otis, see something that looks a little bit like traditional one point perspective, uh, excuse me, when it comes to the rendering of this wall. Um, but I want to focus over here for just a sec on the area of the um, paddock adjacent to the house here. Um, and what you are going to be seeing is the difference between a Western perspective system, which is what you see there on the left, and um, the kind of parallel perspective that is very typical for Asian art, um, is what you see there on your left, you see the a large fresco, Renaissance fresco there on the right. Um, and again, you can, sorry, you can see the uh, vanishing point there in the center. So when we look at that section over here, my detail. I think you can see this in the rendering of the paddock. Um, because there's no vanishing point, the sides of the fences seem to be diverging rather than converging. And on your right, I'm showing you a plate that was made for the for uh, the export market in China. Um, objects like this uh, circulated pretty widely. And you can see the same kind of rendering of three-dimensional space in the platform on the pavilion there. Um, um, and we know that there are these objects and textiles and ceramics from um, Asia circulating pretty widely in the worldwide market. Um, so when we look at Hannah, uh, Hannah Otis's image of the Boston Common, we can see these two perspective systems at play there. Um, a little bit more obvious maybe is the use of hierarchical scale. And when we look, for example, at the figures and at the relative sizes of the plants, what we see is that um, large objects are more important than smaller objects. And also that size and scale get used to render um, social importance. So we see this young, we see what appears to be a young black uh, boy here um, following this man on a horse, uh, but it is, he's, and the young black man is rendered at a smaller scale than the white man. Um, it's not because that young man is a boy, but it rather it is because he's a man, but is rendered at a smaller scale um, as a way of telegraphing his relative social importance compared to the white people in the image. Um, similarly, you can see this little tiny boat here, um, but I want you to notice these enormous strawberry plants, and we will uh, come back to these uh, briefly later. So in addition to regular, regular <laughs> Renaissance style one point perspective and the parallel perspective that uh, people are seeing on these Asian objects or imitation Asian objects, we also have this hierarchical scale um, where the most important things are often rendered at a much larger scale than things that are not. Finally, though, there's something that I call te a telescopic perspective, for lack of a better term, and I, we can see it in the trees. What you see here is the overall uh, massing and arrangement of the tree, but then you have these um, individual leaves, uh, which appear to be rendered at a very large scale. And what I think is going on here is that this this is uh, the effect is um, a little bit like looking through a telescope, which is a relatively new and popular consumer technology in this period. Um, but it also reflects, I think, women's engagement with um, gardens um, and uh, recreational walking, um, where you see the thing from afar, and then when you get close up, you are looking at the leaves and the details. So these objects, I think, also encapsulate a uh, experiential element um, of women and uh, people walking through the landscape and inspecting things, uh, specifically plants, which uh, was considered this kind of ex experience of plants and examining them, botanizing, as people said, was considered a suitable recreation for women. Um, Oops, sorry about that. Um, so there's our summary, and I want to turn now to a specific textile made by Faith Trumbull. This is in the Connecticut Historical Society, and what you see here um, is a large textile embroidered on light blue satin, um, 
all of this stuff in the middle here under the cows and between the buildings is um, was originally all dark brown. What you, what's happened is that because of the dye um, uh, gradually damaging the thread, um, a lot of it has fallen out. And you can see that light blue color peeking through there. So I want you to picture this as this dark brown area in contrast to the um, green fields here. These originally, we know from the back of this, uh, were rendered in tones from kind of a beautiful sort of celery yellow to deep emerald green. So what's going on here? Well, um, most of Connecticut was very was forested before uh, the arrival of Europeans, but European agricultural practice means tilling and you can't have a tilled field without clear cutting. Um, this was incredibly labor intensive um, and um, we did have a bit of a labor shortage in the colonial period. So um, colonists were looking for shortcuts. And one of those is to uh, convert a marshland to a field. So one of the things that, and that's easier because you don't have a lot of trees to start with. And so um, colonists are worried about this. And one gentleman, Jared Elliott, um, writes the first, uh, he writes his first essay um, on agricultural practices. It's the first agricultural periodical in, in America. Um, there are several of these that come out over a period of about 10 years. And um, he talks about using cows and uh, livestock as um, to assist this process of clear cutting and of conversion of wetland uh, to pasture. But I didn't know this when I first started working on the textile, but I did get curious about these cows because the longer I looked at those that group of cows there in the distance and compared it to the cow in the foreground, I kept wondering, where are the hooves? And I finally figured out that in fact, these cows are in standing in the muck, um, you know, up to what are approximately the equivalent of their ankles. Um, so uh, I started wondering, why is that? What's going on? And that was how I discovered that this, using of livestock animals to um, cut down the tall plants in a wetland is part of converting a wetland area to a field. Um, so basically you get your animals in there, they eat everything down so it's short, it dries out a lot faster, um, and then you can cut some channels uh, to drain it. Um, if you leave the cows, in there to keep grazing, then you also get the benefit of they are leaving the uh, animal dung behind, which is a um, important source of fertilizer in this period. And you can see here what Jared Elliott says about this. He says that when the weather grew sufficiently warm and the meadow had settled a little bit, meaning it had dried out a little bit, um, he started to cut these ditches around it to let it uh, so that the marsh would drain. And at that point, then he is sowing seeds. So, and here you see the back of it, and I've just flipped the view so you can see, uh, make this identification a little bit easier. But I started to wonder why her cows were so all different from each other. Um, and one of the things I noticed when I looked at a photograph in the back is that one of these cows was really quite red. Um, I'm sorry, this is not showing up in the same high resolution um, as the other images because the original photograph wasn't a high resolution photograph. And so here's a close up of a, of the cows. You can see where the embroidery or the thread has fallen out, um, but you can see that they are quite different. You have that reddish cow over there on the left, and then you have this very distinctive cow with this bright white stripe, up both along its back and underneath. And I started wondering about uh, this. Was this just decorative? I started seeing some of these uh, striped cows in. Um, on ceramics that are circulating in the parade, a lot of these things that are made in Europe. Um, and uh, one of the things that's happening is that um, uh, these images turn up everywhere. And in fact, publishers publish big books of these images for use for other purposes, including embroidery and drawing and for artisans to recycle and so forth. So um, 20th century did not invent clip art. Um, but I went looking and sure enough, I discovered that these cows probably do correspond to breeds that were known at the time. And I was particularly happy to find that red Devon cow um, among uh, Colonial Williamsburg's heritage breeds. But I also found these uh, lineback cattle. Um, and I also found a cow that was, apparently when you do a certain crossbreeding certain cows, this white distinctive white ring around the nose is something that happens. 
Um, so at that point, I realized that Faith Trumbull is, in fact, paying a lot of attention to the cows and that she seems to know what uh, cows are used for in uh, the broader agricultural practice. This maybe shouldn't be so surprising because she, uh, her family um, made its money in meatpacking. They had the largest, largest meatpacking um, company in the colony. So we do see this. Um, there's a family awareness that cows are part of where the family wealth comes from. And I want to just back up here for one sec. And so if we read the textile from left to right, you can see that we start with wetland. Um, then we have the, which is kind of signaled by these two guys out here uh, who appear to be hunting. Um, then we have the cows cutting thing, all this stuff down. And then as we move further over to the right, you see more and more pl you know, plowed um, grassland and these very sturdy uh, agricultural buildings that seem to really speak to the success in this uh, process of converting the marshland into um into a successful field. Um, okay, so I want to, um, so what, what this taught me was that, and this is one of the first things I looked at in the book and in the project, what this taught me was that um, if we know what to look for, these textiles can actually tell us quite a lot about women, what women knew about nature. Um, and um, that meant that I um, was returning to these fishing lady embroideries, which I had engaged with in an earlier project. Um, the fishing lady is probably one of the most well-known motifs. You see her here in the middle. Again, notice the hierarchical scale. If those two seated women stand up, they are very much taller than the men. <laughs> um, so I think we can say these textiles are, at some level, all about the women. Um, and not surprisingly, with these fishing ladies, um, we get a pond. One of the things I started noticing is that there often is a straight edge on the pond. Sometimes it's at the top. Sometimes it's a vertical straight edge. Um, and I also noticed that as I started looking at more and more of these ponds, that the fish and the ponds are not the same from textile to textile, even though they may share a common source. Um, so this is uh, Sarah Warren, this text house by Sarah Warren. She very conveniently put for us, put her name and the date in the bottom. And I'm just gonna compare this with a couple of other fishes and fish ponds. You can see the, um, here's the edge of the woman's skirt in these other two embroideries. So we see that all three of these are based on a common source, but the fish are not the same. Um, specifically, this one has these speckles and these little orangey, peachy colored fins, whereas this one has um, these kind of circles or sort of chain-like motif um, along the back. And when we, in fact, when we look at a lot of them, that's what we see. We see these, these chain-like motifs and we see the ponds are different colors. Um, now, Sarah Colesworthy's uh, textile, the one I showed you at the very beginning, um, I think is a really useful one to look at in this context because we know what colors she originally was using. Um, in something like this, we could have a combination of brown and blue areas, or this could just have been a different batch of blue thread that is really faded. But if we look at Sarah, but if we look at Susan Colesworthy's textile, we see that we have a clearly we have this brown area and a blue area, but these little blue ripples, some of them are quite large, others are these little smaller sort of gray blue ones, um, go across both areas. Well, it turns out that um, these ponds are really important um, as colonists as the Europeans moved uh, from the coastline in, inland, they um, started damming up rivers to so that they would um, have capture the fish, but also so that they could use the, they could build mills, um, they could build, um, um, in other words, they could use the water for hydropower. Um, that, of course, interferes with any fish that need to go upstream to spawn. And you also get a lot of pollution as people are dumping logs and floating them down rivers to the sawmill um, as they're dumping um, byproducts of uh, tanneries and so forth into the water. Um, and so right away, even in the 1640s, we start seeing laws um, being passed in Massachusetts that govern what you can do with the river that is running or a stream that is running through your property. 
And one thing that you see over and over again in these laws is that you have to let the fish through so they can get upstream to spawn. Um, and you have to do it in certain times of years. Um, sometimes you're only allowed to block a certain percentage of the uh, you know, river. Your, your dam can't go all the way across um, and so forth. So the fish, and we see these laws over and over again, they keep passing more and more of them. And what this testifies to is a real anxiety about the um, environmental degradation of the river, which these people are quite conscious of because they need them. Um, so what happens is you start, you see in these agricultural manuals, you start seeing uh, instructions about how to build a fish pond. Um, and one of the things that the fish pond manuals tell you is that you, um, you know, in terms of how to make one is you build a little dam um, across a low area or around a couple of them in, if you have a little lo low spot on your land, you can build these little dams between the, the sort of in the low, you know, but in between the little rises so that you have a something at least six feet deep. And it can be fed by a stream. You can divert a little piece of your stream to that, or it can be um, just fed by rainwater runoff people are moving fish. Turns out you can move fish spawn in barrels um, up to, a, they can survive in the barrel for up to a week, which means you can move them a pretty long distance. So as they are looking for new habitats for fish or they're finding new streams and rivers that don't have the fish they want, they are moving fish from one place to another so that they will have that steady supply. What the fish pond manual, what the fish pond instructions tell you is that you need muddy water, uh, opaque water, um, in order to support the fish. The water is opaque because it has a lot of stuff growing in it. But you also need some clear water, which I think is represented by this blue section, um, so that the fish have a place to spawn. And what we see here in Sarah Colesworthy's textile is that she's included both. I started wondering about this, is this, you know, did they really know what they were doing? And it turns out that if you um, start looking for instructions about constructing your own fish pond today, they will tell you exactly the same thing. Um, and they will even sell you a tool for measuring uh, the opacity of your water. Um, so they were definitely onto something. The fish, um, maybe not so surprisingly, I think correspond, many of the embroidered fish correspond to species that were important to people at the time. And here particularly, you see this speckled sort of trout-like fish. And again, note the orange fins, which we see here, and these speckles. And then here, these chain pickerel um, fish that, and you see this distinctive marking there on that fish. So it's a small detail, but I think it, when we really start looking closely and asking how it might correspond to actual conditions in the environment and in, um, uh, actual conditions in um, aquaculture practice, um, we suddenly see that there's a lot going on in these textiles. There's a close-up of this blue um, and brown, and you can just see here these two long pale stitches on the back. They are a really bright gold, so she has even included the metal of the fish hook, which I think is quite remarkable. So, what else did women know? Well, um, I mentioned this botanizing, the examination of plants um, as a form of recreation. And um, some people, uh, most famously Governor Codwallader Colden, who's the governor of the colony of New York, um, talks about botany as being um, an amusement for the ladies um, and that women are naturally um, inclined towards this because of their natural interest in dress and decoration. So he aligns this with, uh, you know, something that can be seen as kind of frivolous, that this is just a, you know, extension of women's uh, superficial interest in fashion. But a woman writer at the time um, uh, who uh, writes that these uh, botanizing actually is a good thing for women and the pursuit of botany is a good thing for women to engage in because it exercises your mind. Um, so, um, and she recommends this in her publication, which is called The Female Spectator. Um, um, so we, what we see here is that, you know, we may have a gender difference in how botany is seen by men and women and what its purpose is. Um, um, it, not just recreational from the women's point of view, I think maybe we can say. Um, 
And women were often encouraged to carry magnifying glasses or little scrying glasses so they could more closely um, examine the details of the plants that they and insects that they found. Um, so where is some of this going on? Well, obviously, is there's certain just recreational walking around in the field. But one of the things I started looking at was women's kitchen gardens. Um, and so um, we'll get to that in a sec. I want to um, take a look at Mary Pickering's overmantle, which is still hanging in Pickering House. Um, and here you see many of the motifs that we've seen in some of the others. We see the trees, we see the strawberries, we see the little hunting scene. But I want to talk about her butterflies. There's one there, there's one there, and one there. And these are pretty large. Not all of the textiles include an insect. Um, when they do, they're often very clearly imaginary insects. Um, but these struck me as being... Uh, pretty carefully rendered and not at all imaginative. Um, so I enlisted the help of one of my colleagues in the biology department just to make sure I wasn't totally going off on the on a wild goose chase. And um, uh, we started looking at the back. Um, fortunately, this textile has been conserved relatively recently. And we have a great photograph in the back. You can see these really bright, bright colors. Um, but in particular, when we start looking at these butterflies, something happens. Um, and so there they are, the front and back. And what you can see is that uh, we have the really bright yellow, we have a really bright orange, and we have some blue and orange over here. I'm just going to look at two of these um, briefly. First, let's look at the orange one. This is maybe not so hard to figure out. Um, it is a monarch butterfly, and you can see that she even included the striped abdomen. We see this very distinctive orange, and we see this white speckled border um, on Mary Pickering's butterfly. I was very excited to find this because this is a North American species. Um, this is not something she is copying from European source material. Um, and furthermore, she is showing the butterfly in its um, normal glide configuration, which is what you see here, so that the whole thing is kind of a half circle. Um, butterflies spend about 85% of their time in this position. It's with the wings in this position. It's uh, very efficient for flying. Um, when you see butterfly specimens have been you know, pinned to a board, the four wings are often extended so you can see the whole butterfly, but real butterflies in nature spend very little time with their wings in that posture because it's just not efficient. So I think this means that she is observing these butterflies. They're hard to miss. Um, butterflies, uh, monarch butterflies migrate. I think in there I do, I have a picture of this. Um, and so when they are migrating, you would get these clouds of orange butterflies in the sky, which is, I think, uh, really hard to miss <laughs> if you step outside at all. during. And she is living in the flyway. So I think one of the things that we see here is that we see these monarch, but this monarch butterfly in her embroidery. And although she didn't leave a written record of her interest in um, botany or entomology, what we do see here is her her butterfly is clearly the product of her um, own observation and pretty close observation, um, which made me wonder about her needlework skills and uh, butterfly nets. Um, no way to answer that question at the moment, but. Um, her other butterfly is probably a clouded sulfur butterfly. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the females have a, a sort of dark edge on the wings, which we see here um, and in her embroidery. These are, um, again, would be some North American species only, and they particularly feed on... Um, uh, clover and alfalfa, which are crops that progressive farmers, such as her father, um, were very interested in because um, they seem to really help keep the land fertile. We know now that they are nitrogen fixers and that that's why um, they can help restore the land that has been um, uh, overused and that has been the soil that's been depleted. This was a really important development because it meant you did not have to leave your land fallow for one year in three or one year in four. So you immediately get this 
production, this increase in production of your food crops, which is very important. Um, you can grow the um, clover in the off season. Um, if, even if you grow it during the whole growing season, you can um, feed it to your livestock um, so that you have, um, you're getting more out of your land, which people were really quite concerned about. Um, but their caterpillars could be quite destructive. Um, they could eat your whole crop. So these, if you, if there were too many of them, so these yellow um, or orange sulfur butterflies uh, were something that was both ubiquitous, both in her environment. Um, they're quite pretty, and they also represent a potential agricultural pest. So I don't think it's a surprise that they turn up uh, in her textile. Um, and so you can see them here. And when we start thinking about them, you can see that these butterflies are about as large as this woman's torso. So I think very important indeed. Women also spend a lot of time in their gardens. Um, the fields may have been the province of, and the large orchards may have been the man's domain, the husband's domain, the father's domain, but the kitchen garden was women's territory. Um, these gardens could be quite large. Um, one woman's diary, um, uh, talks a lot about this and I've looked at plans. I was lucky to find a map of Boston. This is made by Peter Pelham, who included an enormous amount of detail in this map because um, he was turning it over to the British. <laughs> um, and so he includes resources for the soldiers, uh, which include, you can see these houses here with these little lines that, uh, or boxes behind them. These are the raised beds. So I was thrilled to find this. Um, and it gives you a sense of the scale of these gardens and these raised beds. You can see that they're, you know, they're they're as wide as the house. Um, so you gardeners in the audience know this is a lot of gardening. Um, and Sarah Warren includes this plowed up area and even includes a strawberry plant in here in it, right next, right there between the woman and the house. And I think in some other textiles, we see some of the terracing that happened on sloped fields. Um, you'll notice these wavy lines here, this undulating ground. And in this area, these are, um, we have this very strong dark blue that really makes those undulating, those undulating contours pop. But up here, we don't have that. And we have a kind of stair-step configuration to the side of the hills. Um, we know this is an important method of uh, organizing your your kitchen, your gardens, particularly your kitchen gardens, if you are on a slope. And in fact, we have a letter from John Hancock, who is writing to a contractor um, about his about his um, garden areas, and he is paying this guy to create these terraces uh, as they step down from the house um, in preparation for making a large kitchen garden. Um, and we see some of these other contoured areas, I think, in some of these other textiles. This is Eunice Bourne's. Um, but I want to call attention to her strawberries here. Um, we had a very, um, strawberry was a very kind of glamorous plant in the 17th century. One of the things that we know is that European strawberries were very small. Um, but they're also a really important food crop. They're the first fresh fruit you get in winter, uh, at the end of winter. Um, and um, we know that they also have more vitamin C per ounce than oranges do. One of the problems with living off your dried potatoes and your dried apples and your, you know, your dried meat and all of your preserved food over the winter is that you're not getting that vitamin C. Um, it's destroyed by heat. So even if you are preserving things um, that have vitamin C in, them in the first place, if you're heating them at all in the preservation process, you're losing it. Um, well, lo and behold, what do we find? When we look at cookbooks and housewife manuals aimed at women, they also include a, a section about uh, brewing your own household medicines. What we discover is a recommendation to mash up strawberry plants um, and to make a beverage out of them, and that this is uh, good for, as one manual puts it, healing spongy teeth and gums. Well, these, of course, are the classic symptoms of scurvy. Um, so, which some people are uh, referring to as a real problem. Conwell or Colden, for example, who we looked at a little bit earlier, um, talks about this saying, he's writing to a friend of his and saying that this is a rampant problem in the colony. Um, 
Um, so this was a seasonal health problem that kept coming back. Um, and so the strawberries are really important, um, not just because you're probably bored out of your skull eating all these, the same thing all winter, but also because the um, strawberries and the medicines made from it were gonna make you feel better. Um, however, we also have a new strawberry. Um, and that the story here is really kind of fun. Um, Louis XV sends um, one of his engineers who happens to also be an amateur botanist um, as a spy on a, um, and he has him enlist in the uh, go along on a Spanish voyage um, to Chile. Um, and his job there is to map out the fortifications, um, which he did, um, but he's, really known to us now his claim to fame is that he found a strawberry unknown to Europeans on the voyage and the South American strawberry, the um, Chiloensis, um, is a uh, much bigger than European strawberries. Um, it's a lighter color, light pink. Um, and he's very excited to find this when he sees indigenous people growing this. So he grabs, he picks up a bunch of plants, he takes them home to France, and they immediately get propagated and sent out to all of the various royal botanical gardens, personal, private plant collections, and so forth. Um, so it becomes part of this kind of um, fire hose of botanical specimens that are circulating around the globe as part of this global bioprospecting that is such an important part of emperor of empire at that time. There had been another strawberry immigrant to Europe, and that is the North American strawberry. But what happens is that as much as people try to crossbreed these, uh, the European and the um, American varieties, they won't breed together. We know now it's because they have different chromosome numbers. Um, but I think what happens is that one of these Chiloensis plants, when it comes, if you're one of these people, like you know, William or John Bartram, um, who is a um, plant collector, when you get that strawberry specimen from London, the first thing you're going to do is go out and stick it in your wife's garden bed with the other strawberries. Women's garden beds would periodically be restocked with wild strawberries. And um, so that meant they could be picking up either the European strawberries that had naturalized um, uh, as a result of Europeans bringing European strawberries to the new world, um, or they could be grabbing um, the so-called Virginia scarlet strawberry, which is the native North American strawberry. The North American strawberry and the South American strawberry will breed together just fine. They have the same number of chromosomes. And that strawberry, believe it or not, is the ends, is the basis for all of our modern strawberries. You get a big red strawberry with good flavor um, and it's cold tolerant, which is also important. Um, and so I started looking carefully at these strawberries in women's embroideries. And one of the things that you can see from Frazier's drawing is that the South American strawberry has the, as with the North American strawberry, has these very rounded leaves compared to these more pointed leaves that you see on the um, European strawberries. And so I think what's going on is that some of these women are referring to that, particularly Temperance Parker, you see these very round leaves. The Chilean strawberry also is a little bit heliotropic and we do see she's got some strawberries that are seem to be sticking up there in the middle. Um, whereas in one of these other um, uh, textiles, you see these narrower, smaller strawberries with these pointed leaves. But Eunice Bourne has a lot of strawberries in her embroidery. Um, and I started looking very closely at these. This, her embroidery has more than twice as many as the next most numerous um, group of berries and it's about four times the number of berries that you see in any any other textile. Started looking very carefully and I started seeing that she's got a lot of attention to the anatomy of the strawberry plant. Um, so she seems to be paying attention to this. One of the th major differences between European and uh, American strawberries is that the European berries carry their seeds uh, in raised bumps up on the surface, whereas the New World berries have them in little divots, which is what we're familiar with today. Um, and you see them here all along the bottom, um, almost as if they are at the edges of a raised bed, which is exactly where these gardening manuals tell you to grow them. So um, overall, I think what's um, going on with these textiles is that um, is that women actually know a lot about nature and the embroideries are often the only record we have of that. Um, 
So overall, the book puts the works in the environmental uh, history of the period. Um, I'm arguing for women's uh, knowledge of many facets of nature. Um, and I think that we can think about these embroideries as part of a wider spectrum of visual technologies such as prints, botanical illustrations, flower painting, and so forth, uh, still life painting that represents not just natural products, but in so doing, it also represents um, this knowledge of nature. And um, I think that women knew more than they were getting credit for. So um that is what I have for you right now, but I'm happy to take questions. Uh, let me stop sharing my screen. If I can find the right button. There we go. Excellent. Thank you. I feel like I should clap for you. That there <laughs> needs to be that that noise at the, the moment. Mm -hmm. I just want to say I am never going to look at these um, fishing lady embroideries again. So of course, library company is my favorite cultural institution, mm -hmm. but winter tour is my second favorite yes. cultural institution. And so mm -hmm. I see these on actually like a fairly regular basis, mm -hmm. um, when I visit there. And so now I'm always going to want to take them off the wall and see what that, like, how fascinating was it to see the, the reverse and be able yeah. to actually see how bright these are. So yeah, now I'm yeah. going to, Taking I can't wait them to off share that. Won't help you. <laughs> well, yeah, I know they're, they're never stitched to a mount, but yes, I'm, I really <laughs> wish I had X ray vision like Superman. <laughs> yeah, well, and how fascinating that you were able to see that while conservation was taking place. Yeah. You know, like such lucky timing, yeah. um, really. So we, I want to encourage mm -hmm. um, audience members again to put any questions that you have into the Q and A. Popper, and we actually do have two questions mm -hmm. already. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start okay. doling them out because actually the these are two things that I've been thinking about too. Um, the first question is: Was this form of decorative landscape embroidered panels more common in the north than in the south in northern colonies versus mm -hmm. southern colonies, um, and whether or how regional distribution might play into your study? Um, I'm looking at most of the embroideries that I'm looking at were made in and around the Boston area, um, but certainly in New England. Um, I don't think they get made as often in the South, and it's partly because the elite families, um, except for places like Charleston and Baltimore, are not concentrated in one area. And so sending your daughter to school um, becomes more of an issue. Of course, these are textiles. They're made of wool and silk, so they're really vulnerable to mildew, insects. Um, the Civil War, of course, burned a lot of places to the ground, um, and they went out of fashion after the Revolutionary War. And so if you stick one of these things up in the attic without proper protection, then when you pull it out 100 years later, um, which is when people got interested in them, in them again, as around the centennial, uh, it's going to be in pretty bad shape. So I think they were not made as frequently, and I think they just have not survived. I mean, the um, 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 humidity also is a huge problem, mold is a problem. So, but I think right. this is mostly a New England practice, basically. Right, well, and I wonder how many young women spent their young lives in Charleston or yeah. Savannah or something like that. You know, the I think the practices of mm -hmm. where colonists were probably impacted that too. So it's really yeah. good, a really good point to think about. Mm -hmm. um, so our second question is, is there any evidence that these women were using plants to dye their own threads? They almost certainly are not. You can, the, these women are buying or their, they, or their, their school teachers are their, you know, their, their finishing school director basically is buying these things, buying the, the, um, the wool or silk floss already died. Um, and it's largely coming from England. Um, um, yeah, although I am really interested in that piece of the material culture, the dyes for these things are coming from all over the world. So that those bright, bright pinks and reds are coming from cochineal and these dark, beautiful blues are coming from indigo. So the at the material level, these things do participate in this larger picture of global trade. And I do talk about that in the in the book. Yeah. Right. Uh, building off of that mm -hmm. um, and really thinking about the production, another attendee asks, do you know if women are typically trading tips and tricks with one <laughs> another about these compositions, given that you're thinking 
about work that was made within a relatively circumscri circumscribed region? Can you see visual references from one work to another that we might think of as self-conscious? Um, mm -hmm. I know this would have been happening in a school or female academy context, but mm -hmm. I think you're noting that these took place outside of the school context made by older women. These are made in the finishing schools, the pictures. Right. Subsequent embroidery, you might see these motifs. So the Met, for example, is a fabulous armchair that has a, a large image on the back that's very similar to what's on the cover of the book. Um, so, yeah, I think absolutely. Um, and that women bring a level of expertise to these uh, to the viewing here in a period where having that kind of aesthetic appreciation is valued. Um, oh, I made that dress yellow. Um, oh, you know, that jacket should have been blue. Oh, I made this, I, you know, I had, you know, an oak tree instead of an apple tree. Um, but if you look very carefully at some of the, particularly the paintings of, uh, I'm sorry, the, the textiles that depict shepherdesses or even the seated fishing lady, what you can see is that although they share a common source or figure is that you can see that, that, that if you look carefully, that it has been cut at the waist and often at the neck to reposition the body to make to get a certain posture or to make the body language different. Um, it's pretty subtle, but it, you can definitely see it um, in a number of these things. Um, so I think, yes, they're absolutely doing that. I think there's probably a little bit of competition. Um, <laughs> and I think these big these big embroidered over mantles, which is a particular format, um, I think also they function kind of like, you know, uh, alumni license plate holder, you know, I mean, they are a badge of, a, of an elite education um, and and all that that implies. Um, yeah. the, the time it takes to make one of these and the time that women would spend in these schools is uh, one author estimates this costs about as much as sending your son to Harvard for a year. Wow. It's a significant okay. capital investment. And I think, does the book mention that there seems to be kind of signatures of certain um, teachers who would, there are kind of details that were passed on from certain teachers to their pupils that there you are can kind often, of trace out? Yeah, well, the fishing lady is associated, we think, with one one particular teacher in Boston and possibly her, I think it's her daughter or her daughter-in-law who is her successor. Um you can often track which attribute them to particular schools based on a standard motif. So that one I showed you from Rhode Island comes from Mary Balch's school. And you almost always see that kind of arch shaped um, frame within the frame and then a building and the building typically has something to do with the father's occupation. So if he's a judge, you see the courthouse, um, that kind of thing. Um, and Betty Ring and other collectors did a ton of work on this kind of thing. And I'm really grateful to them um, so that I didn't have to do all that legwork. But <laughs> I am less interested in the sort of provenance of these things and really interested in like why those motifs at that time. Yeah, yeah. understandable. Um, one uh, additional question mm -hmm. that we have um, says, thanks for your fascinating research. To what extent did the works depict what was happening in an area or what people hoped would happen? Ah, that's a really interesting question. These embroideries are, these these landscape over mantles are overwhelmingly optimistic. Um, and they, to, so for example, the fishing manuals, the fishing, the, agri, you know, the aquaculture manuals talk about this. There's very breezy kind of tone, like, oh, once you have this, it's completely no, there's no expense and no effort because the fish take care of themselves. And um, so it's all very breezy. And the, and the agronomy manuals just, you know, hundreds of pages of details about how to amend the soil, when to plow, when to plant, what to do, all this excruciating detail about what to, what to do. They never talk about the harvest. Mm. Never. Which I think is really interesting. There's just this assumption that if you get that far, it's going to be groovy. Um, but of course, things can go wrong. Um, but it, we do see in a couple of these textiles, uh, women do depict the harvest. And so that's what's on the cover of the book. And that that view is really very, again, very optimistic. It's the field is crammed with grain. <laughs> um, people are harvesting. It's not a problem. So the, I think these, these do... Um, speak to things that are actually happening. When I first started looking at these things, I started wondering, well, if she's sitting there, you know, with this thing on her, you know, that she's embroidering and like, what's going on outside the window where she's working? Mm -hmm. Yeah, or what's going on outside the window of the building, of the room where this is hanging? 
And she's thinking about that very clearly. I think so. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> this is not yeah. in a fantasy world necessarily. No. I mean, there are, like I say, there are some of these things that are very, um, that have this kind of fantastical element. Like you see that little miniature hunt scene across the bottom of some of them that's in a much smaller scale, like a little commentary. And I think that has to do with the kind of role that some of these images played in courtship practices, but there's so much more than that. Right. Right. Well, you, you hearken back a little bit to when you started, um, pursuing this mm -hmm. research and could you tell us a little more like what brought you to this, <laughs> this particular um topic in the first place well um not being able to answer student questions in the classroom <laughs> to a certain extent I teach a course called American Women in the Visual Arts and one year I was standing there kind of grumbling to myself while my students were taking a quiz and thinking you know there's no book to assign in this course right this is really just a complete pain every year and then the penny kind of dropped it's like well I've been teaching this course for a long time I should do that so on my next sabbatical which was the following year um, after having gone away and done a lot of reading over the course of the next year I finally had my time off and I thought okay I'm going to do this get the outline of the book I'm going to write that first chapter I'm just going to get this embroidery stuff out of the way so I can get to the really interesting things <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, okay, well, there's fishing lady turns up in a lot of things. So there's got to be something written about that. I can talk about that as this motif that turns up. Well, two months of solid research. I couldn't find a thing that talked about the meaning of meaning of this. And I really thought I must be missing something. And I was feeling really dumb. And I emailed our arts librarian and asked her and she got back to me a week later and said, nope, you didn't miss anything. There was nothing. And so I thought, okay, I have to crack this myself. So that was really the first thread I started pulling. And then I got really interested in this when I started looking at these more closely and figuring out the connections that they might have to contemporary culture. Um, and that led to a fellowship at Winterthur, which was awesome. <laughs> and, but I was still thinking in terms of, okay, so maybe I have a chapter in this book on embroidery, but the more I found, the more I kept writing, the more I found, the more I kept writing. And I kept, and it kept narrowing in on these over mantles, these, um, landscape these large landscape pictures but I kept finding more and more stuff and finally one day I woke up this was probably about the winter of uh, right around the end of my fellowship at winter tour and realized it's like oh you have 30,000 words that's almost half a book you are writing a book about embroidery <laughs> so not something that uh, I ever would have foreseen at any point in my earlier career but it really was just a case of finding this rabbit hole and falling into it like Alice. <laughs> right. I am shocked actually to hear that there isn't more work on the fishing ladies. Not really. I mean, I published one article on this, but there isn't, there's, there's, um, but there's, but yeah, I mean, people, the scholarship had been, it's so hard to track down where these things came from because they right. almost, they're almost never signed. And so right. um, it's very hard to we, we always like to sort of start with the biography of the artist when we're thinking about these things. So a lot, right. I mean, a lot of, a lot of, that's sort of our, is our first instinct. But if you have to, if you're starting with something and you don't know who made it, then you need a different approach. And, and right. I usually am, um, but I was really interested in why these motifs. And so to a certain extent, you don't necessarily need the biography of the person to talk about that. Um, the biography helps you talk about what might be personally important right. to somebody, right. but um um, but I was really interested in after my experience with the fishing lady is like, what is going on with all these motifs that keep getting repeated there there. This can't be just a matter of people copying over and over again. They're repeating these motifs because they're important. They speak to something important in their lives. Yep. Yep. Do you two kind of final questions? Mm -hmm. I've, what, I'm just fascinated by <laughs> all that you must have learned about cows and <laughs> strawberries and butterflies and all of these things and kitchen garden yeah. so you know did you come to this one of my questions is mm -hmm. did you come to this with a lot like are you a gardener is this something or is this something that you had to add and did doing this research and having uh, having to approach this as a from a different point of view than an art historian might normally like mm -hmm. from the producer to and that biography to the the output. Do you think that's going to reshape the way that you're doing research moving forward in your career? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I've always been a, a historian who kind of goes back and forth. Uh, you know, there's that sort of artist-centered production account, but I'm also, but once the object is made and it gets out into the world, then there's this other, there's this a whole bunch of other things that get attached to it. So I'm always interested in, I've always been interested in that also. So mm -hmm. it's, so as a, I tend to go back and forth between that, but I, I guess over time, I'm more and more interested in 
you know, what happens to the object after it leaves the artist's hand. But um, yeah, I was, I, you know, I'm a, you know, a recreational gardener, I guess. I'm, you know, I mean, we've got raised beds in our backyard. Um, what I did, and one of the things that was so wonderful is this project took me down so many interesting byways. I just never thought, I learned so much about so many things. Um, one of the things I think is interesting is like, you know, we're very, um, we do monocropping even in our vegetable boxes. It's like you've got the row of carrots and you've got the row of tomatoes and you've got the, that. And colonial gardeners just mixed all the seeds together and just broadcast mm -hmm. them. So you really had to know what you were doing when you were looking at those plants, right? Stinging nettles, great in your soup. In your lotion, not so much. <laughs> right, right. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Two other kind of like final mm -hmm. questions sure. came in. One is... Do you know what types of embroidery stitches were used in these particular these are works? Interesting. In the, interestingly, in the previous century, you see a much bigger range of stitches. These are mostly uh, what's called tent stitch, which is like our modern needlepoint, only very much tinier. These run 400, 500, 600 stitches to the square inch. Um, so they're, they're really tiny. Um, you do see French knots. Um, I know of one textile that was made all in Romanian couching, and I'm trying to, I'm still trying to figure out why that is. Um, um, that I think points to a particular school, but I don't know which one yet. Um, but you also do see really interesting little details, like sometimes when the woman has a necklace, it's real beads, teeny tiny real beads. Um, um, so they're, these are interesting, I think, for their motifs in terms of the kinds of stitches. Um, if you're looking for a big variety, then you really, are, the earlier ones had more. And another uh, one of our participants mm -hmm. asked uh, that a colleague stopped by. Mm -hmm. Actually, we had multiple uh, <laughs> participants behind one of our names. And so one of their colleagues had stopped mm -hmm. by and was watching with them. And would it be possible to share the link for the recording with them once that of course <laughs> once that is made available awesome well i, I want to give a second to see if there are any last questions that come in <laughs> for andrea tonight um i know i'm going i think i might incorporate this strawberry uh story mm -hmm. into my lecture about the colombian exchange <laughs> <laughs> honestly uh, because it's always a struggle to make that real to students and so i think thinking about the various ways that strawberries moved across the atlantic might be actually be really helpful then we can yeah. eat strawberries together which is right awesome. well and they probably got those little <laughs> little square boxes of strawberry jam in the you know in the dining hall <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly oh i hadn't even thought of that um uh, i love that so I think without seeing other um, okay. questions coming in, I want to thank you for joining us tonight and telling us about this and showing us like really beautiful pictures, both the, the front and the back of these amazing embroideries and helping us to think about women and their labor mm -hmm. um, this month. So we really appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. This is really fun. I'm delighted to be able to share this. It's something that's very dear to my heart. <laughs> so I very much appreciate being able to do that. <laughs> We are really, every, everyone is saying basically thank you. Everyone really enjoyed right. it. So thank you for, uh, to thank everyone you. who is here this evening um, for joining us. And please, um, in the webinar chat, there's some links to our um, other events mm -hmm. and some of our social media. And please look out for the recording link to be sent to you soon. So thank you so much for thank joining you. us this evening. <laughs>